There is another regimen that we should probably spend some time talking about, and that's the so-called R-squared regimen, rituximab and, um, and lenalidomide. There's data now um, in a variety of different settings with this, uh, with this combination. Um, where do you see this fitting in? Uh, the, the front line, second line, third line. What about the what about the toxicities associated with this? Are you uh, are you a believer? This is a great question, and I think we struggle a lot with this. As Peter's mentioned, the microenvironment in follicular lymphoma is critically important, and how we target that. There's probably various mechanisms, and whether we use combination of approaches again is something that's currently under investigation. The beauty of this combination, in my opinion, is that you're targeting T cells and NK cells, and the combination is probably much more uh, important than single agents, and so that you can enhance the T cells and NK cells and then direct them potentially at the tumor in the microenvironment signaling. That being said, we know that it appears to be effective in phase two studies, and now we're all eagerly awaiting these randomized phase three studies that will tell us where is the appropriate use of this treatment. Now, as we've all been involved in the drug development for lymphoma, when something looks good in the relapse setting, we rapidly move it into frontline. So right now we have randomized studies in the frontline, so untreated for lymphoma patients that are of high tumor burden, looking at R squared or lenalidomide plus rituximab versus R chemotherapy. It's a little bit different than the gallium study schema in that you could choose your chemotherapy um, as a physician according to patient characteristics. So that might tease out a little bit differently, but we're all eagerly awaiting that data. In the relapse setting, we have the AUGMENT study, which is again a randomized trial looking at R squared versus R monotherapy. And then we've all heard preliminary data from the MAGNIFIED trial, which looked at an induction of 12 months of R squared and relapsed indolent and mantle cell lymphoma, um, followed by a maintenance randomization. So again, the randomization, in my opinion, that study is probably less important other than it might answer the duration of therapy. But all of these studies suggest that we're excited about the potential efficacy of this combination. The toxicity appears to be manageable and maybe not that much different from chemotherapy, but again, how we um, implement this new regimen, whether it's frontline in the relapse setting, whether you wait till you fail two lines of chemotherapy and then introduce it or introduce it in those early relapsers, because there's some data out of the MAGNIFY study that looks quite promising, I think we don't know the answer yet. So when will the, the relevance trial read out? I mean, there's sort of a, a joke in uh, academic circles that you have to be a, you know, an instructor or early assistant professor to begin a career in, in follicular lymphoma because these timelines are so, so long. Is there going to be an early readout on that, on that study that will have a, a hint of what's going on? Yes, we're anticipating that. And this is a good example of we need earlier endpoints or earlier readouts and endpoints in frontline follicular lymphoma because we're going to have a study that's going to read out where the standard of care may no longer be the standard of care. And what I mean by that is we have the gallium data now that says obinutuzumab plus chemotherapy might be the current standard of care in frontline follicular lymphoma. That being said, there, are, there is a novel endpoint in the relevant study looking at a complete response rate at 30 months. That was generated out of a chemotherapy-based uh, database, so whether or not it's truly a surrogate marker for PFS in a non-chemotherapy-treated patient population is, is still unknown. But we are anticipating a potential early readout um, later this month or next month. Peter, you're, you've used R-squared a lot. Your group has used this regimen in a variety of different histologies. Any tips on patient selection? I mean, there, there are adverse events. There's there could be risk of thrombosis, there's rash, there's, you know, who do, who, who's the ideal patient for this? Yeah, so uh, actually Sam Yershon from, uh, 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 actually a student at uh, Cornell is gonna present data uh, tomorrow looking at the risk of thrombosis uh, with lenalidomide in lymphoma patients. And it, interestingly, it doesn't seem to be the same as multiple myeloma, so I'll just put that out there. Maybe it's because we're doing a better job now of uh, preventing it in all of our prospective trials, but it may not be the same as multiple myeloma. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in all the follicular lymphoma, there's patient selection going on, right? We all make the, those decisions. I think um, I'll say that in general, my bias uh, until recently has been to uh, treat maybe patients with less bulky tumor. Um, some of that may just be uh, a little bit of a lack of experience, right? I mean, we don't, if somebody has a big bulky tumor, you sort of want to get a response pretty quickly. If they're really symptomatic, you want to get a response quickly. We know that chemotherapy does that. Uh, we don't know necessarily how quickly lenalidomide is going to work in those patients, but as we get more experience with it, we may uh, uh, change that. So, so in general, my bias has been to use it in people that maybe uh, don't need immediate uh, responses. 
And then also, as, as Loretta said, you know, if, they're, if they've been refractory to chemotherapy, I'm not going to go back and use it. And uh, R squared makes a lot of sense in, uh, in that setting. We had patients on the relevance trial, the, you know, the, the frontline study that Loretta described, and it was incredibly popular because um, the thought of having a chemotherapy, you know, quote unquote, chemotherapy free mm -hmm. regimen was very attractive to patients. So I think there's a lot of people that are going to be interested in seeing what this, uh, the results of this frontline trial, and, and then we'll have yet another uh, uh, issue to deal with, with how to sequence therapies yeah. and beyond that if that turns out to be turns out to be. Possible. I've wondered about that. What if what if it's equivalent, for example? It's still a it's still that means it's still as good as chemotherapy and would be a reasonable option in certain settings, even if it doesn't beat chemotherapy but does well. There are patients that probably uh, would choose that over chemotherapy. I, I suspect there are a lot of patients, and it probably does come down into the details about the uh, the, the, the adverse events. I mean, we think of it as quote, as being a chemotherapy-free regimen, but it's not without its own set of adverse events. Yeah, some of that is due to duration of therapy too, right? I mean, uh, the clinical trials that uh, Nathan uh, and you guys did at MD Anderson and the one we did through the CALGB were one year of therapy and that was it, right? And all of the registrational trials are, are, are longer durations of Revlimid and that may impact tolerability. Um, so we'll, we'll see, the data will come out and we'll have a look at it. Do you have any experience with any of the, um, the rituximab biosimilars and you know, what do you, how would you, even if you don't, how would you incorporate that into your practice? I uh, have no experience with any of the biosimilars, but I've had discussions actually with European colleagues who have now uh, a lot of experience with them and, and what they've told me is they're, n they're not often the ones making the decisions, it's the hospital administrators that tell them. The clinical trials that have been done that I've, I've seen have suggested that they're, they're pretty equivalent. And uh, I accept that, you know, I don't, I don't think we need to see a lot more data. Yeah, th those, those are usually considered on the totality of evidence. So there's a structure similarity. There are some preclinical studies and, uh, uh, which, which showed uh, similar um, uh, activity. And then uh, they are usually much smaller, as you know, studies which are done clinically to, to compare efficacy and toxicity. But they are not necessarily powered fully to to re recapitulate uh, initial findings with uh, original drug. Right, but the, but the issue is really extrapolation, right? So what we learned from the obinutuzumab, we cannot extrapolate now and for all diseases where it worked good for, let's say, follicular lymphoma didn't work better than rituximab for uh, 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 diffuse large basal lymphomas. And the question then, is this the same for biosimilars? I, I see probably this sim, should be similar pattern. And that's the concern here. In, an, in one way, because they're biosimilars, the bar is too low to show that they're relatively similar, but you're not required to repeat every single trial to show that they're still similar in, in certain diseases. So it brings to the issue, like when these agents are not tested in cur curable diseases, which I can understand why they didn't do that, I mean, I don't know. We'll see how they will play out. I think for non-curable cancers, it's perfectly fine. There are a lot of similarities. I would feel very comfortable using them. For curable intent, I'd like to see more data before I make a switch. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I think the bar for, for uh, incorporating into a follicular lymphoma regimen is a lot lower than, than in patients with large cell lymphoma where you could really do some damage if, if the drug wasn't as absolutely as equal to, uh, to rituximab. So. If you look at the, some countries though with limited resources, it definitely did expand the access. So um, uh, we, we see quite a broad use of biosimilars, uh, for, for example, in, in Asia uh, or in Europe as well. I wonder if the comment that earlier that it's, it, that it, that it, that it's probably more the, the, uh, the administrations that's gonna make some of these decisions, I worry about that a lot, um, than, than the individual physicians and the individual application.